Good morning, everyone. My name is Todd Cochran, and you are watching or listening to the Saturday Morning Tech Show. And coming here from the Palatial Studios in Honolulu, I've got uh, Norbert Davis from Totally Cool Tech up on top. Good morning, Norbert. How are you? I'm doing great, Todd. How about yourself? Oh, I'm, uh, I'm, <laughs> you know, I I'm, I'm alive. You know, I really, really am. I, uh, I, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I told my wife my schedule. I said, uh, I'm flying, uh, out for a week to Austin. I'm coming home uh, Friday afternoon and I'm leaving Saturday night. And she says, why don't you just stay out? And I had already scheduled myself to, well, my, uh, I'm finished. I finished up my college classes a couple of weeks ago and it coincided with, uh, them having, uh, the ceremony today. So in about three hours, whoops, in about three hours, I walk. So I uh, get my uh, sheepskin, I guess. So, you know, a little tw 20, uh, 25 years later than norm normal for when people get their degrees, but, uh, but I'm done. So that's the, the important part. I don't think that's uh, too much the out of the norm anymore. I think a lot of people, you know, older people are going back and uh, getting their degrees. My mom did it when uh, I graduated high school. She uh, she went to college with me, as a matter of fact. Oh, that's cool. She went and got her a degree, and now she's a teacher and all that. Yeah, and when I was in the Navy, I really didn't need one. And then I was getting ready to retire and was worried about jobs and didn't know if this business was going to take off or not. And so I started. But, uh, yeah, at, uh, four years. I, I finished in four years, which wasn't too bad, so. Hey, uh, Dr. Bill's on the bottom. Good morning, Dr. Bill. How are you? Oh, doing great. Tired, but like we were talking about earlier, we, we've had some interesting times lately, but, uh, you know, it's it's going well here. Well, that's good. Well, of course, both uh, Norbert and uh, Dr. Bill are part of the Tech Podcast Network over techpodcast.com. And uh, definitely it's, you know, you've changed up a couple of things, but you are at drbill.tv. Is that where you're at now? Uh, yeah, I've got basically two main uh, websites, drbill.cc, which stands for Computer Curmudgeon, of course. Right. Uh, <laughs> that is the main site where the blog is. And uh, then drbill.tv is the video feed. And it's pretty much just the whole screen is the video. And uh, I've got some icons and things around the bottom. But um, between the two sites, I call the program drbill.tv as a shorthand. Our Dr. Bill, the computer curmudgeon, is the long name, but uh, uh, I had a hiatus there of a couple of years, as you know, right. and uh, been building the audience back up now. We're uh, Recently, I was noticing we had about 27,000 or so that have, have joined us, so nice. uh, the more the merrier. <laughs> Very good. So, Norbert, you're still at Totally Cool Tech, right? TotallyCoolTech.com, right? Definitely, yes, and uh, starting to do some video, too, so be looking for more of that well it's looks like you've got it dialed in this morning i see you're representing the marine corps as well this morning with a t-shirt so uh oh, yep. semper fi thank you <laughs> Hoorah. there you go so well i tell you you know i was uh as i was you know kind of getting stuff ready here actually i had the studio kind of tore down as when i travel i i make this room a little bit more usable so that, that people don't trip over stuff when i'm gone and I was uh, you're hooking all this stuff up, and I was like, my God, this is just ridiculous, the amount of gear. But, you know, it's it's really kind of cool. Where I, was, I was telling uh, Dr. Bill about some stuff I saw recently, and, you know, doing video these days is becoming easier. The folks at uh, Blackmagic have uh, put together a new uh, uh, $1,000 1x8 switcher. It's a device that will fit in a 19-inch rack, but it's only – a couple inches deep so you could really almost mount it anywhere and uh this pretty amazing device you can run eight cameras into it and uh, plug hd the hdmi out from the camera or you can use the um the sd input or sdi input so they've got both you can't do like an sd camera so it does have to be a camera that can do hdmi but you know that does all the heavy loading of doing the switching and then it will actually also um, it's got functions to record the video, so it's got kind of an MP4 recorder, and um, it runs through a, um, basically the switch on it is um, similar to um, like the TriCaster, except it's on the screen, but you can use a program like Wirecast or VidBlaster to, you know, do all your overlays and all the other stuff, and so what I, you know, what I spent all this money for here, um, now you can essentially do for about two thousand dollars versus 
you know, the high price of a, of a TriCaster or similar equipment. So, um, um, I think it's pretty cool. Someone was saying that your audio was low, Dr. Bill. I, I didn't think so. I thought we were good. I can turn you up a little bit back here on the audio. All righty. Um, there's, well, I start to say there's not a lot I can do on this end. I might could uh, adjust it, but I, I'll let you try it first because... Yeah, you're you're, you're not bad. The way it is. <clears throat> okay. You're not bad. So you know, but technology is just advanced and stuff's getting smaller and smaller. You know, and uh, it won't be too long, and uh, the price of it goes down. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to look into that. I'd like to see what I could do with it. I'm. Is someone got an air? I'm hearing a buzzing in the background. Sounds like someone's yep. shaving. I'm trying to take care of that right now. <laughs> there. Hopefully that'll do it. <laughs> Funny, hey! Um, I, got a, I got a fan. All of a sudden, the uh, it's the CPU cooling fan. It, it cools uh, the unit, but it all of a sudden it's just gotten noisy. So I got to go take care of that. So, so you got one that's uh, gotten a bunch of uh, lint in them, like they do from time to time, and it's it's just I know what it's doing. <laughs> yeah, it's just vibrating. It's, uh, it's a pain. It's funny. Hey, let's talk a little bit uh, new new news out, um, and this just came out this morning. Um, Time Warner saying once again that they're considering usage-based internet billing, so, you know, considering Comcast is on uh, billing. You know, the, the Time Warner had taken quite a bit of heat the last time they talked about this, but once again, they are raising the uh, raising their flag on this. What do you guys, uh, you think this is inedible? We think we have no, we're not going to have much choice. This is going to happen ultimately. I think there needs to be more competition generally. Uh, a lot of people have got either Time Warner or DSL now, I had Time Warner, and the the service was so terrible that I ended up uh, going to the phone company and going with DSL. But they've got a new uh, 20 gig download and all roughly one gig up. Um, and with their new fiber optic, since they give it out my way, which I'm a little bit out of town, out in the country, but uh, they're going to have uh, 30 uh, symmetrical, 30 meg symmetrical. And I will be on top of that when, when it comes out. Uh, but right now, I'm pretty happy with DSL. Uh, and unlimited, no caps. Um, runs about $50 or thereabouts. So, you know, pretty good. You know, I'm out here on the end of the line as far as DSL goes. Seems like that's how it always works out. I'm the farthest away from the switch. So I can only get about maybe three meg down and a meg up on DSL. Then I've got my... Time Warner is our only choice here. We don't have any other cable provider. So See, that's the way it is so many places. That's that's why we, we really need some more competition. I had great hopes for Google with their ubiquitous Wi-Fi initiative a few years ago they were talking about. I'd love to see somebody pick that up and run with it. Yeah, Out here in uh, Elk Grove, which is just south of Sacramento, we actually have a couple of options. You, know, you have, obviously, you know, your dish network and your direct TV um, and the local any local phone company with dsl but we also have comcast with their xfinity now uh, but we also have uh, a company called sure west and for about eight nine years now i've been on fiber optics so i've i had this for a long time and actually was able to get a, an ip number so i've got a i've got a, a set ip number that i pay for static ip uh, and i'm getting 20 meg down and about 15 meg up so Jeez. my my speeds are wow. awesome you know and i've been yeah. on this for like i said eight years yeah you know, when the when i saw them digging in the area you know i was hot on it and i was telling my wife we're gonna get fiber optic we're gonna get this really fast internet you think that the dsl is good wait till you see this and uh it's been awesome uh, you know i i, <laughs> I haven't gone back to anybody else because nobody can touch it and they even have 50 megabit um business class service available wow. if you want it <clears throat> you know, and I'm, I think we're, they doubled the speeds here in, in Hawaii earlier this year and we went to 10 megs down and still less than a meg up. So that's, that's the best you can get here unless you go out and buy commercial services and have them dig a line in and, and, uh, it's just, you know, I, what I've got a project going here in Hawaii right now where, um, I've kind of let the cat out of the bag already. I'm talking about doing something similar to what Leo's doing, but it make it Hawaii entertainment, food, culture, that type of stuff. And I'm working on getting talent lined up. And so it'll be an actually 
local kind uh, network of content. I won't be on it. It'll just be local local talent. But you know, we're that actually sounds pretty <clears throat> good. We we'd be able to get that onto the uh, the local cable companies as well. Um, you know, that do... right now is not the plan. If they want to take it, they can. But we're going to be web based and have about start out with the goal of having about twenty hours of programming a week. But my biggest challenge thus far is we're looking for a studio location. And um, ultimately, we want it to be um, in a hotel. We want it to uh, be so that you can see Waikiki Beach in the background and, you know, have the full Hawaiian vibe. But the infrastructure yeah. in the hotels and contracts are so forth that I'm having trouble getting around because um, the you know, hotel says, well, you have to use our, our internet provider. And I'm like, no, we were you don't need, I don't need hotel class speed. I need, I need commercial class, high speed internet. Exactly. Um, this is not something. And so our biggest challenge, believe it or not, has been, uh, the hotel has been buying off an idea, but having a, um, the ability to get the right kind of bandwidth in, which is kind of crazy, but, um, that is one of the small stumbling blocks to get this thing off the ground. Can't use a virtual well, studio and a green screen and a webcam based uh, uh, where, well, wherever to, to get the scene you want for the background? No, because we plan on doing like in-studio stuff too. We plan on doing like, um, uh, have you ever seen any Japanese game shows? Have you ever seen any of that stuff? Oh, yeah. So we plan on doing yeah. some of that type of activities. So, oh, yeah, you know, that kind of cool. You know, you can give away rooms and hotel rooms and airfare and you know, you got this great destination and then you have the people that win come to the show. And so, you know, just do on the beach stuff or, you know, the guys walking on the beach talking with people about, you know, what's going on with the surf or, you know, what they've been doing on their vacation, you know, the good, bad and the ugly. And <clears throat> I think it'd be a lot of fun. So it's just a, um, it's a big project and, uh, um, I'm actually just going to manage it. I'm and I'll be hiring people to, to run it. And, uh, it's going to be a separate new company, but we'll be, um, I'm excited about it, but it's just going to take, uh, you know, just got to work through these details. But, you know, every time it's here in Hawaii, the big issue is getting the access to the, to the, to the, you know, enough speed to make it work. And, uh, yeah. well, have you heard about, uh, Knoxville, Tennessee? They now have one gigabit symmetrical right. available for, for like it's like seventy dollars a month or some ridiculous price, wow. and the whole approach that the city is taking is, what can what kinds of new business paradigms can you come up with if you've got this kind of bandwidth to work with? And I think it's gonna it's gonna revolutionize a lot of what we do with video and with, uh, uh, I guess you call it independent uh, television, uh, IPTV. Uh, it's going to be some neat stuff coming out of that, but I'd, I'd love to see it here. And I think that's what we need, like you say, is just more bandwidth where we can do more with it. Who's providing that, Dr. Bill? Is that a city city mandated or city sponsored? Or It's city sponsored. I don't know who the company is. I, I want to say it might even be Comcast, but I'm not 100% sure of that. Uh, but the city is sponsoring it only insofar as helping build the infrastructure out. They aren't getting the revenue. Uh, but they're encouraging, they're basically wanting Knoxville to be known as the most connected city. There you, know? you go. And with that alone is going to be a big draw for them in terms of bringing in businesses and developing new businesses and that kind of thing. It's a great idea. It's awesome. Oh, definitely. I was, definitely. I was trying to find the, um, the article, but there was an article either yesterday or the day before that was talking about, you know, so, here we got Time Warner thinking about implementing usage-based internet billing. You've got some of Comcast of the world are already doing it. Now we're going to have they they've already reversed. You know now we've got uh, limits on our mobile usage, and they have uh, come out with a report that in the last six months, the amount of usage that each person is using on their mobile device has doubled, just in six months. Yeah. If you're using, you know, the average person was using a meg or gig of data a month. Now they're using two gigs. In just six months, that's doubled. So, <clears throat> you know, now we're going to be, at some point, we're going to be stifled. Innovation is going to be stifled, I believe, because of bandwidth caps. And, you know, they're talking about this new great service with, you're going to, uh, with Docsys 3, they found new ways to go 
Um, cable Vision has found a way to get the um, cable speed to 30, uh, 30, what did they demonstrate? They demonstrated 30 gigs symmetrical. And so that tells me that it won't be long before the cable companies will have overcome their, you know, they'll be able to compete with fiber in a big way. And not that they're going to give me 30 gigs to this house. I'll, you know, I'd be happy for, you know, a gig. Um, <laughs> the the simple fact that they're, they know people are going to be using more bandwidth. Cox is uh, introducing, or Comcast is introducing through some markets, a tripling of upload speed because they know that there's heavy competition coming in some markets. So where you may have had a meg before, they're starting to open up more channels, and now you're going to have a three meg upload pipe. Um, to me, you know, that sounds good from that retrospect, but I just, you know, I guess it, well, if you're in an area where there's no competition there, it's, there's no incentive for them to do that. It's like my Droid uh, phone here. I've got unlimited uh, internet access on it, and uh, I'm paying, I don't know, it's a, it's a premium. It's like 30 extra dollars a month for unlimited. But um, I don't know if I'm really using it or not, but I just like the fact that I don't have that cap. I'm just kind of, I don't know. <laughs> it's just me. But now just Verizon is no talking worries, about yeah. making unlimited limited. Right. They still call it unlimited, but they're talking about limiting it. And it, it, that just chafes me because uh, if I want to watch a whole movie on my phone, which – I probably would never do that, as <laughs> small a screen as it is. But if I happen to be sitting in a parking lot waiting on my wife to get out of the grocery store and wanted to watch a show, fine. I should be able to do it without having to worry about, oh, what's that going to do to my bandwidth? And that's, like you say, it stifles creativity. It stifles uh, potential future software that we haven't even thought of yet that somebody's going to come up with it will be the next big thing. I don't think it would stifle uh – innovation it, it's just going to stifle billing and people's willingness to 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 use it which i guess would stifle some uh you know innovations but i can understand that that you know maybe you maybe we have to have a tier system you know i mean i i don't use a lot of, i don't do a lot of texting my wife of course does um and i have an unlimited system for that on verizon but it, you know, i wouldn't mind a tiered system but i think that the infrastructure that we have right now is not going to be able to hold much more advances in bandwidth traffic until we <clears throat> basically redo it. I mean, you're looking at a lot of the copper that's out there, and they're they're doing better jobs at having uh, higher bandwidths across copper. But you're going to have to go to the the, the fiber optics and, and redo. What's down there underneath the streets or above, you know, on the power poles? You know, they just don't have enough infrastructure right now, I think, is the, the main limit. Well, I think, you know, just like anything else, you get better technology if you really want it. And it's through investment in, in, mm -hmm. in your equipment. And that's, you know, just like they demonstrated here that they're able now to show fiber speeds um, on a traditional cable line with minimal amount of uh, hardware upgrade. But, you know, I think the, the hardwired infrastructure is definitely going to have to continue to grow. It's something we all want. We need it. It's going to drive the economy. And if it doesn't keep up, it's going to be an issue. You know, you look at what we're doing here, and, you know, I, I live in a major metropolitan area. I live in a city that, uh, or, you know, basically what would be considered a normal size of a, a typical county. And we've got, uh, you know, a million people. Here in this uh, this metropolis, now it's it's not an island, but it's typically not much bigger than a regular county would be in the, or maybe like Orange County or something like that from a population density. So from my perspective, is is you know I'm here, I'm living in a major metropolitan area, and I have so few choices. And relatively, now again, I guess for the average person, maybe they're completely happy. And I here I am looking at it from a commercial sp perspective, and when they can't keep up on a commercial perspective there's there's something really really wrong and but we'll see what time warner does on this uh, they got so much pushback last time that uh i don't know if it's going to work this time it scares me because if they go into a usage-based internet billing um you know i'm already in a business account i'm already paying a huge amount of money uh we'll see we'll see what happens but uh time will tell and 
I think it's just going to get more ugly as time uh, time going on. Um, let's talk just a little bit about the uh, what happened up in Vancouver after the uh, Bruins beat the. Uh, and I'm not a sports guy. I was with a uh, has a had a buddy with me last week that was a huge, huge hockey fan. And of course, uh, every night that they were playing, he was unaccessible. But uh, they're saying now that they are using Facebook, Twitter, and Tumblr, and a variety of other social media websites to uh, take faces and match them to the idiots that were doing what they were doing, and he's going to use that to hunt those folks to prosecute them. Any, uh, any I think thoughts? that's great. I think that's great. You know, if you're in public and you do something stupid, uh, and there's a camera <laughs> there and, and it's, you know, put out there that it, that it's there. Um, I think that's just a tool that the police have a right to use and should use because they can go back and get uh, financial you know, compensation for, you know, any damages and so forth that they cause to public, you know, infrastructure or, you know, even private, uh, businesses or whatever that got damaged. It's perfectly fine. I think this is a great thing, and uh, maybe this will help deter uh, things like this happening. You look at you the... Know, you, uh, you, got you can't some, be in a riot anymore and get away with it. You got people taking videos, so you got one... At least I'm looking here. You got one, two, three very discernible faces that maybe four, and this is just one snapshot from a live video that was being taken of these guys rolling this specific car over, and... Uh, you know, at least some people were putting up, pulling up out their hoodies and had sunglasses on and so forth as they were riding and, and, you know, they were planning to, as they were robbing businesses. But it will be curious to see how, how many people they're able to prosecute um, just because of the yeah, use of social media. I think the thing is, I mean, you know, it's to me it's crazy to ride over sports. I'm not a sports guy like you. I've I just don't get that into it. However, and it's bad behavior, don't get me wrong, but I do see a concern in terms of general overall human rights privacy if this continues to the point that anybody with their camera on their phone or anywhere you go, any video that's going to be streamed up to YouTube or whatever can then be turned around and used for purposes other than Maybe it was originally intended for. I really would be concerned if it was the police themselves that were constantly videoing everything all the time, everywhere in every city. Um, I mean, at that point, it's almost... And, and they do that in London. I mean, that's not unheard of. Um, but I just... That's a lot of power in a few people's hands from my perspective. So I get a little antsy about that. Maybe it's the, the libertarian bent <laughs> in me. But... Uh, <laughs> It is an interesting social phenomenon that we just don't have the kind of privacy. We can't expect that privacy anymore. But when, but when you're out in public, Dr. Bill, what kind of privacy do you really have? You're in public. And that's, that, that's exactly and, the way the laws are, is even if you're a – well, whoever you are, if you're out in public, all bets are off. Now, if you come into my home and you start videoing, that's a whole other animal. And I understand exactly. that. And, and, I don't, and I don't agree with the police, say, confiscating or using someone else's uh, personal video that got uh, taken uh, on a cell phone camera, whatever it is. But if they're using um, Twitter and Facebook to match faces with video that they took from yeah. public cameras, that I think is fine. It's, I, I would consider that camera to be a virtual cop you know, with a virtual set of eyes, mm -hmm. and he can just remember everything. Um, not exactly 100% happy with it, but I see where it can be used for good. You know, I don't, yeah, I don't like and, them and taking, taking pictures of, of sure. me, you know, in my house, but, you know. Yeah, one you know, thing's put, for I put sure, stuff you, on you video, so not... I, I kind of put, put myself out there, you know, as we, as we all are doing right now. Right. Well, you couldn't argue entrapment. You couldn't argue, I went out there to capture you doing something one way or the other. It just happened to be that I had a camera. I you know, picked it up and was videoing with it, and you were doing something stupid. I caught you, you know, perfectly reasonable in that sense. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah. I just don't think that using someone else's 
camera going and you know Joe Blow who was out there just recording it, you know, personally and taking that that video or that film or whatever it is to 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 find these people and prosecute them with. Now, if it's a news news agency filming, that's different. I think that's because they're going to put it out to the public. That becomes to me public uh, works in a way, or the uh, the police's um, monitor cameras or whatever they have a city safety cameras, whatever they want to call them. It's perfectly fine to yeah. use those. You know, I think what we're seeing too is that you look at. Um in the UK, if you go into Britain and you go into downtown areas, the heavy commercial districts in that area or around the pub, you know, there's districts of pubs and so forth. You know, you're, you can't, uh, there's not very much you can get away with, um, because they have a huge, huge, you think that we're under surveillance. The, you know, the Brit, the British are used to it in, in a big way. Um, and it helps them, you know, prosecute people. And again, this is public places, but you look at what, where a lot of convictions are coming from criminals these days is that, uh, in matter of fact, um, I was asked, uh, about three weeks ago, uh, by my local, um, uh, police department to look at video from my cameras that are facing the street to basically, uh, give them about a six hour run of video that, that uh, I had shot from the street cause they had an issue down the street and they were trying to identify a, a specific vehicle possibly being on my street. And uh, from what I understand is that information helped them um, solve a, basically what was a ring of people that were hitting uh, residents here in robberies. So um, I think that, uh, you know, most of these folks that are out uh, doing criminal activities, uh, they, you know, they get really got to think twice about where they're being, you know, how they're being captured in their movements um, at the same point, I, I do understand what Dr. Bill's saying about our, you know, certain point, our liberties being invaded. And I think, I think at this point we can all agree that, you know, that uncle Sam and everyone else has got a uh, pretty deep insight on what we probably are doing on a daily basis. Uh, if, especially if they yeah. want to be, you know, if they want yeah. to be looking at what we're doing, but, uh, we also got to look at, you know, how much of that are we putting out there ourselves? I mean, look at, look at yep. all the things on YouTube, yep. look at all the Twitter things. Yep. Um, we, we're our own worst enemy when it comes to our own security. You yep. know, we put everything out yeah. there and then when something comes back to bite us, then we start, you know, crying and uh, we, we really need to educate ourselves and really think about what we do. You know, it's like, yeah. If you want to become a politician, uh, everything you do from that <laughs> point on is in the public. Yeah. You, yeah. Know, you, have, Never. you have no right to privacy. <laughs> Never. Well, yeah, exactly. uh, <laughs> I got into an, ar well, not an argument, really. Is, it, was a, he, it was a discussion yesterday at work. Uh a friend of mine there was talking about how he would never use Google again because they knew everything about him and his family, and, <laughs> and, and they were gathering all this data. And I'm like, you know, Phil, <laughs> here's the thing. I doubt very seriously they know it's you by name, that they're targeting you. Uh, they know maybe your general uh, socioeconomic level. They know what you're surfing. They're gathering that and doing data mining. Yes, and that is troubling. Don't get me wrong, but I, I just don't see that they're holding a dossier on you individually. <laughs> uh, but still, that's the world we're living in now. We've got to be more aware of it. Everything we do, every site we go to is being registered in a database somewhere. That's true. It's, yeah, you know, and I look at how we pull data together, find out, you know, for just billing for advertisers. We break people down into countries and we don't go into individual statistics on each individual viewer or listener, of course. You know, that would be, you know, first of all, it's not needed. But, uh, you know, we have a pretty good idea where people are watching and listening to certain programming and, I'm sure you know, there's been a lot of companies that are doing a lot more stuff a lot deeper than that. Let's talk, you know, let's get, let me try to switch gears here a little bit and tie this into an article that was over on TechCrunch about uh, 20 hours ago. Um, and it's about PR people. Um, I, I'm sure, you know, you guys having creating media, doing blogs, you're getting probably dozens of emails a day from PR people pitching you articles. And this one specifically that was um, they were talking about the folks over at uh, Facebook and they ran the story on their Facebook project called Project Spartan. And it was basically about some apps that they're building for Apple and how they're trying to recontrol their 
ecosystem. But the PR people began emailing journalists immediately after they wrote this, trying to pitch them stories uh, countering this guy's articles. And what Facebook PR failed to realize is that um, that they were emailing people that were really more loyal to their own kind than did some PR flack. And people were was alerting TechCrunch writer to this uh, this PR spin. And uh, here's an interesting quote. He says, you guys should remember that there's not much, excuse me, you guys should remember that there's not much new in tonight's TechCrunch story, began one message. You guys should, and these were the words that were put out by the PR person. Um, so in other words, you guys should, and this is, you know, it was followed up with a message. He goes on to say three words that should never come out of a PR person's mouth ever. Um, so what I get all the time now, is, and it's just driving me insane. And the, the email starts like this. Hey, Todd, uh, love your site. Following what you're doing. You're doing great things. Hey, I've got an article on a specific product service event um, widget. Would love to submit to you. It's original writing. And uh, we, we've got a, you know some writers and we'd like to give you this article. Well, I played along a few times and gotten the articles from these people and just looked at them. I've never posted them. And, you know, what they're doing now, PR agencies are preying on small bloggers who are in need of good content and they're essentially buying them off with a, and this is, it's worse than what it's even what has been before. So now they want to buy them off with a written article that would go up on your blog. Now, there's just no way I'm going to do that. There's, you know, never in this lifetime is, am I going to get an article submitted by a PR hack that I would ever put up on my website? And I basically have t responded back, if you want us to review the product, you send us the product. I'll give it to one of our writers. They will review it, use it in a real world situation and write an objective review. Same thing on using the service. And it's amazing how quickly, oh, we have limited number of review units, and but yet they're willing to, you know, so much easier to try to give me an article. So do, do you think at this point we're getting to the, a time where there has to be some sort of disclaimer put on websites and put into articles um, saying this is original or this was submitted by or, you know, I know we do disclaimers on um reviews already when I whenever we get a review I said this product was provided by such and such company as a review unit um, what do you guys think on disclaimers on you know written articles I think if if the person is not already associated with that blog or site or podcast whatever it is and something is just put out there posted uh, it does need to have something on it that says this is not a normal uh contributor to this this site or whatever you know so at least you know it's it, it's it's different than what you would typically get from that site Dr. Yeah, you're, you're basically advertising uh for the company because they've hired this person to put out a favorable article obviously and they're trying to get you to run it for free in effect so now you're advertising for them without getting any revenue out of that and uh, monetizing websites is one of the hardest things I've found uh, to really get your, your arms around and do it well. And that's one reason I'm so pleased with uh, Tech Podcasts and, and Blueberry and everything that uh, the guys at Raw Voice there are doing for us as podcasters because uh, I'm just one guy out here in the middle of nowhere at High Point, North Carolina. You know, I don't have access to everything that you guys do and so by joining together it helps us but in the same way because you're a little guy out here as todd was saying they they take advantage of you they try to say hey we've got this article you can post it get content on your site and i'm getting more and more aware of the fact that even if you look at search engine optimization for your own site google is looking for content that is fresh is original uh, is not a, just a repost of an article from somewhere else. And they're looking at that verbiage, and they're determining whether or not your site is valid and useful depending on what you have posted. 
So in a way, it's putting even more pressure uh, on us to come up with truly original, unique content. And to be honest, that's that's actually a valid thing. We should be not just recycling information, but putting our own slant on it. That's why people watch us. That's why people listen to us. And so it keeps us honest, in effect. I, I definitely agree. You know, it, it's you know, it's it's sometimes hard to come up with you know totally fresh and innovative articles. Um, it's not That's totally sure. difficult, but um, y- y- if you're going to repurpose something, you need to at least put your opinion onto it or uh, give it a different angle uh, exactly. in, in presenting it. So, you know, you know, I've had the same Todd where I've gotten a couple of uh, solicitations to put an article on there or things like that. And I've, I've turned them down. You know, I've, I've done some review units of things, but I do say that, uh, as a matter of fact, I just got in, uh, a new, uh, device. It's a dry case. I don't know if you've heard of these Todd or, or bill, uh, where they, ha- you put your, your iPod in there and it's a, it's a clear case and it's waterproof and it, it vacuums down and uh, you can use uh, your iPod in the water, your iPad, your Kindle, whatever, <laughs> and you use it at the beach or the pool. And uh, I've done a review on this, and uh, it's actually pretty cool. So, but uh, you know, in my in my review and all that, it, it it is put out there that this is a review unit. I was provided these, uh, and you know, I'm I'm not getting paid to do this, but I was given this. I didn't purchase it myself, unless I did purchase right. it myself. Then I will say that as well. One thing that we're seeing too is that the, uh, for a better word, you know. I, I used to get emails all the time saying, hey, can you can we buy a link on your website? And I, my response was, I always said, yeah, sure, we, you can buy a link on my website. It'll be $10,000 a week. And, uh, <laughs> and that's that's basically what I put in. And people like, for a link? I'm like, oh, yeah, that's what the, you know, well, what is your traffic? And, you know, I would say, and I said, well, that's ridiculous. And, well, that's you're, what you're asking me to do is ridiculous. And, uh, yeah. it, you know, to sell my soul, it's $10,000 a week. <laughs> you know, for uh, for a link on my website, and uh, usually everybody they, has a price. <laughs> yeah, every, every, you know, usually they go away. You know, and yeah. uh, but um, you know, and so I feel that this new tactic that they're taking of buying or trying to buy you off with an, a submission of an article is a new form of link baiting, and it's actually a much better one because it's embedded in the quote unquote content of the of the website. So well, um, what makes it what makes it appealing is that the the blogger uh, doesn't have to do the work. Right. They don't have to review it. They just, you know, post it. Poof. They're done. Hey, they got content on their site. Maybe some more traffic. That's very appealing. Yeah, it sure is. Yeah. And, and they're actually also appealing to ego because I'm contacting you because right. of your awesome website. You know, exactly. and you can fall into that whole trap. You sure can. So, and then, you know, that's something I have to, you know, when we have new writers come on board, I caution them. I said, okay, you're going to start getting solicitations for gear. And I said, you know, I said, I want you to be very careful. You know, if if you end up writing an article about a piece of gear that I know is a piece of crap and you give it a positive review, um, then we're going to have some internal communication because I want everything to be objective. And, um, and, you know, and, and, and I think for the most part, People that ask you to review gear, you're going to get something that's decent because they they know that um, they're not going to risk sending you their piece of junk uh, gear to get a positive review. I just don't. I think that at least that part they're smart enough to know know better. But uh, believe me, I've seen some weird stuff come across my desk. Hey, <laughs> version 1.0 or less. Yeah, you know it's, it's, <laughs> yeah. But it's and you know sometimes and I'll give the courtesy of them. I'll send an email back and say, listen, this is. Uh, what I'm finding, I say, can I get some response from the company? Can you tell me what you're going to do to fix this? And I'll try to give them the benefit of the doubt that way. But if they don't respond, then it's, you know, it's publish time. So we'll see. Hey, let's talk about, you guys are obviously calling in on Skype today. And uh, Microsoft has gotten approval to buy Skype. And uh, they won U.S. antitrust. Uh, basically, they've said that there's no antitrust issues. And the FTC says that Microsoft may go forth with their $8.5 billion acquisition of Skype. What, uh, what's your thoughts on the, on the approval for them to move forward? I don't have a problem with it as long as it doesn't become 
uh, dependent on the Microsoft operating system. You know, um, I, I don't mind it being. Uh, it, I don't want it to be totally integrated with it. I don't mind that they you know, optimize uh, Windows and Skype to work well together, but I think it should be able to work, uh, you know, obviously, on any platform, but I don't want it integrated into into my operating system. I would imagine it would be preloaded. I can't imagine it not being. Dr. Bill, What? Are you, any thoughts? Yeah, I'm a little nervous about it, I'll admit, uh, mainly because I'm an open-source kind of guy. I've, work with Linux. I'm a little leery of Microsoft, um, though they do have good technology. And I think Microsoft's real claim to fame, even from the beginning, is that they have bought some good ideas and some good companies. Yeah. And uh, they, then they put their name on it. Um, left to themselves, they, they come up with Microsoft Bob. But uh, <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> I just think that uh, as long as they don't screw it up, if they'll leave Skype alone, uh, it's a great service. There are alternatives out there, including some open source tools. Aren't as ubiquitous as Skype is, but the tools are there if we have to leave them. But to be honest, this thing works really well. Uh, and uh, there's some third-party software. Um, there's one that I have called Super 1010 that uh, is very inexpensive that allows you to have multiple Skype sessions uh, that you can then record and do a show very similar to what we're doing here, extremely inexpensively using Skype. And, and I'd hate to lose that capability uh, if they started fooling around with it and cutting out those third-party tools like that, I would uh, which agree. Microsoft I has would agree. done. I'd hate to see yeah. them limit, limit the ability of other uh, vendors to do anything with, that, with Skype that maybe – you know, Skype wasn't doing on their own. I mean, Microsoft is almost a necessary evil. They do have a lot of resources and people and talent that they can take something and, and expand on it. But I would like Dr. Bill was saying, I'd hate for them to go ahead and remove uh, some functionalities and capabilities that we have right now, you know, with third-party software and things. You know what you're going to have to do, Norbert? You're going to have to smack that fan. <laughs> oh, I know. It's... <laughs> I, I, I got to get another one on 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 uh, on order here. It sounds it's, like it's, feedback. I keep hearing this. Beep, beep. It, it, it's, I think what's going on is the uh, I think there's a bearing inside that thing is that's it's got it's you know until it's about to go. It's about to go, and the smoke is sparked to roll out of the back of it. So I know, I know. I'm about to let out the magic like excitement. Smoke. I do apologize. That's funny. Hey, I, have you guys done anything with Bitcoin at all? Have you guys? Uh, bought any bitcoins no i no. have not <laughs> you know there was a big heist five hundred thousand dollars worth of bitcoins were uh basically hijacked uh earlier in the week uh and there's new malware out right now that are targeting uh bitcoin traders or those that are actually have bitcoins and uh i think bitcoins uh, under the uh uh overlook of the senate and folks right now because they've got uh, had some crazy stuff being bought with bitcoin there it went it quit what'd you do did you put a pencil in it and stop the fan you from know what i'm hitting the mute when uh when i'm not talking so i'm, <laughs> okay. I'm gonna do that, that? there you go that, that works hey, high tech so the uh so anyway what's there's there's new malware out that uh looks for this dat file that is stored on your computer that uh that goes after the malware. Like if you get this DAT file, if you're able to capture it and steal it, um, you then are basically have the possession of the keys for the for those bitcoins. Uh, I'm not fully familiar with how it works uh, completely, but uh, um, that now people are sweating it. They're they're under attack from a I mean, some new malware to to basically rob them of of their uh, of their of the currency. So, any thoughts on? Bitcoin at all, or do you think the future of Bitcoin will will work, or good old greenbacks going to be continue to be a, the currency to use? Well, I, I don't know a lot about Bitcoin specifically. I have read a little bit here and there about it, and uh, I definitely haven't looked into it. But in a similar vein, uh, there's a lot of talk about um, being able to store money on your phone and then scan as you go through a kiosk or something like that through your phone. And uh, 
to me, it's almost like the whole business with a regular credit card where somebody can scan your credit card uh, in the back when they go to when you pay in a restaurant. And now they've got your credit card information and so forth. It seems to me that opens up a whole area of people stealing your information, identity theft, uh, tapping into your accounts because of the phone is broadcasting. I mean, you know, well, there's going to be ways to tap into that through malware of various kinds. They've been using payment system NFS. I think it's called Near Field Systems um, in Japan right. for 10 years. And believe it or not, yeah. I've been thoroughly disgusted that they haven't caught up here in the United States in all these years because you can basically yeah. take your phone in Japan and put it up against a vending machine and you have to put a pin in. There's a little transaction you have to do, but you'll get a soda, you buy groceries, buy a lot of stuff just right on your mobile device. And to this point, it's pretty secure. They haven't had very many issues with it. Um, well, that's just, good. If, if they've got that kind of experience with it, you know, and we can leverage that, um, maybe it won't be as bad as I'm thinking. But uh, it seems like all we see in the news these days are people that are tapping into all kinds of accounts. Like we were discussing before the program started about Bitware being hacked, 18,000 right. accounts tapped into Sony, uh, the CIA of all people. I mean, they yeah. all know what's, <laughs> what's going on, and they got hacked. You know, I've got an article about those guys, and do you – can you – you know, let's, let's, let's think about this. Okay, we attacked – no, they attacked Sony. They attacked all these different groups, and then they're going to go ahead and attack the CIA, CIA's government and website. Mm. You know, let's, let's, let's stir the kettle a little bit here, and, and, you know, these guys are just asking for, for trouble. They really, really are. Oh, now, yeah. They put out a manifesto a couple of days. I think the group is called Luz, Luzsec. I don't know how they're supposed to pronounce them. Lutsec, Lutsec, Luzsec. Someone's going to correct me here at some point on yeah, what this French. <laughs> but uh, they put out this manifesto that um, I read it. And I was like, wow, you know, these guys are are hardcore, and um, mm -hmm. we'll see. We'll see where this goes with them. But uh, I think they. They, they better be good at covering their tracks. If they don't, they've made a lot of enemies here uh, recently. Uh, any thoughts, when go, Norbert? When you go up against the boys in Virginia, Whew. you're really going to get in trouble. Uh, yeah. Those those guys don't like playing around, and they'll find you one way or another. They've got infinitesimal, infinitesimal uh, resources, and they will find you sooner or later. They will find you, and they will put you out of business. Um, these guys are crazy for going after the CIA. I mean, it's bad yeah. enough that they're going after other, you know, private companies and so forth. Uh, but now they've gone after governments. They're in big trouble. Yeah, it's uh, it's going to be interesting to see where it goes. But as far as this Bitcoin stuff goes, I guess it's you know anywhere for any way for people to make a buck. That's for sure. Well, I you know I yeah. I only use PayPal, um, and I have a totally separate account from any of my other banking accounts. And I only keep enough money in there to cover any kind of bills that I know I'm going to have with it or any kind of future purchases. I, I just put very little in there, and it's just totally separate from any other account. So if they get that, oh, well, they're going to get maybe maybe 100 bucks at a time, you know, and that's it. So I protect myself that way. I don't, I don't have it tied to my regular account. Now, that's smart, and, and that's what people should do. But you know you're in the very tiny minority that do that. Yep. And charge it. I charge mine with a with a credit card, so I don't let them keep the uh, credit card information on file. But I do. That's how I charge my PayPal account. I I, I have a a banking card. It's a debit card, and I go into that bank and I transfer money from one account to the other, and that's the only way you're going to get money in or out of it. So, unless of course you know Todd and uh, Tech Podcast casts are going to be paying me. So. <laughs> <laughs> but it's tied it's tied to my PayPal account so you know I can get paid through there but the amount that I actually keep in there is very little at any time if it gets too large I mm -hmm. pull some of it out there is a um, let's move on here to a new topic Senate committee votes to make illegal streaming of movies TV a felony moving closer to a possible loot and this was over at hollywoodreporters.com Actually, let me bring the article up on the website here. Give them credit where credit is due. Again, at hollywoodreporter.com. 
they say moving closer to a possible loophole in the in the uh, laws against the pirating of movies, TV shows, and other intellectual property. U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee on Thursday approved making illegal streaming of video over the internet a felony, and the Commercial Felony Streaming Act, Senate Bill 978, introduced by Senator Amy Klushbar, Democrat of Minnesota, and John Corrin, Republican of Texas, reconciles the disparity between the current law and streaming of content and peer-to-peer downloading. The uh, legislation is approved by the administration and, of course, by all of the majors. And this specifically um, makes it illegal to stream motion pictures and television programming. And um, so I, 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 this doesn't come as a surprise, and, but it's a felony. This is, a, this is what's totally amazing. The penalties increase up to five years in prison when it involves 10 or more instances of streaming over a 180-day period. The retail value of stream video must, not, uh, must exceed $2,500, or so the license of the material must be worth more than 5000 Now, here's the thing that makes me a little bit nervous. If I was to take and load up a segment of a television show, let's say I wanted to talk about 60 seconds of something that happened at CNN or Fox, or if I wanted to take um, um, some sort of a piece and use that in a fair use capability, um, I'd be very, very worried about doing that and it's even you know some folks are taking c-span information and they're using that in their reporting and uh, replaying that back um i don't know what do you what do you guys think about this uh the implications here and you know a lot of people are weighing in on this that's where i have a concern when i saw that i kind of immediately went to what are the implications to those of us who are streaming our own video now obviously the content is our own content, and, and and you would say, well, there's no concern. But you've hit on exactly what's concerning me, and that is, what about if I want to review the new Green Lantern movie and I get just a little bit of video to splash up there? Am I now in violation? And wh- what are the cutoffs? And YouTube is already uh, sending out you know little warnings saying, hey, you may have copyrighted content in your program. And I've just pretty much cut out using any video that I didn't personally produce uh, for that very reason. Uh, and it, it is restricting because it's nice to throw up, you know, on the screen behind you something you're talking about, even if it's just nothing but a trailer. Um, there needs to be some kind of understanding there of what's fair use. Here's, here's an interesting, and I'll, Norbert, I'll let you comment in a second. They say, even supporters of this bill who insisted that they were wrong about what the bill allowed, eventually conceded that our argument was accurate and that the bill could be used to put people in jail for embedding a YouTube video or doing a lip sync video. So I, if I load someone's YouTube video and plays it on the show, which I do all the time, I could be charged with a felony. I, I think that even some of the people who are, you know, the senators and representatives and all that that are going to be approving this legislation... I don't even think they understand it. I mean, it, no. and those of us who, you know, produce content and are, are the ones that are fearful of this legislation, we don't even fully understand it. So it, it, it I don't think there's enough explanation, uh, like Dr. Bill is saying, you know, can I, can I put up a, a trailer for, you know, it's a few seconds and talk about it without being in trouble. Uh, these, these bits of legislation are so, um, confusing in the way they're written and they're restrictive uh, to the nth degree that you don't even want to get in this business, you know, and do anything like that just for the fear of being, you know, put in jail or fined. Yeah. I, whoops. I, um, let's see if I can get the right screen up there. I, I don't know. I don't know where this is going to go to be honest with you. And it, uh, it makes me, makes me a little nervous. And uh, if, if a, if someone doesn't like you, and you have a you've said something negatively about their material and you've used a clip of it in your content you know that's where the danger is you know if you if, you know if i see someone's content and i think the guy is completely off the chart and i use a section or i you, you know segment the commentary around the person's content to make my case while I'm allowed to have an opinion and say what I feel about something relatively safe from 
uh, from, you know, from prosecution or from, you know, you're never really completely safe from lawsuit. But as long as I don't slander someone and I give my opinion on a, on a, on a piece, um, you know, I'm relatively, I'm relatively safe. But if I use any part of, it's like you can put anything up now and, and, and people, if people use it, you can, you know, get them charged with a felony. I, I, it just, it scares me. Yeah. I think that fair use takes takes precedence over this, and as long as you're not streaming the whole thing, the whole entirety of the the, the piece, I think you're fine. Um, I mean, this kind of comes back around to the article you had this week in your thing, where that uh, UK student is uh, going to be extradited or is facing extradition to the U.S. just for providing a link to a a set of. Uh, um, content that is uh, copyrighted and those servers may not even be in the United States and it, the United States is trying to, to sue this guy. It's, it, it's almost ridiculous into that, you know, extent, you know, did this guy, is he actually, is he streaming the, the, the content? No, he's providing a link to it. I don't think should be prosecuted for that, but, um, I don't know. It, it, it's getting a little bit confusing on what you can and cannot put up on the Internet. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and that's the, essentially it. It's confusing, and there needs to be some clarification, and, and I, don't know, I don't know where we're going to get it. I mean, I can envision it would be great if I had the ability for somebody to request use of my content, uh, maybe a particular uh, episode or something, if I could just electron, they could ask me electronically. I could approve it electronically uh, on the website, and then they have a license, a small license, to use that content. Uh, I don't know that we'll ever see something like that, but I think it may get to that point at some point. Well, uh, YouTube has implemented the ability for you to assign exactly. Creative Commons licenses to your to your. Um to your videos. So at least from that standpoint, you can set the usage requirements or usage allowable um, within the, within YouTube. Now they just started doing that. It used to be, you have to, you'd have to cut and paste your license type in. And um, I ran into a situation last year where, well, I really only copyright one piece of video content a year. And that's my podcast award ceremony that I retain copyright on everything else. People can use as a, as they please in the, um, uh, you know, cutting it up and taking pieces of it for their own shows if they want. But, um, you know, I think that's what we're all going to have to do. But the average Joe, I don't know if he knows about Creative Commons. So hopefully, we'll, maybe that will be the way we'll mitigate some of this over time. But don't, we'll see. But, you know, I'm not always pulling stuff from YouTube. I'm pulling stuff from all over the place. Yeah. Hey, um, last article here, and I'm going to wrap the show up at just about an hour. Um is uh, talking about AOL. There was an article over at the FasterTimes.com website, and let me actually bring this up. And the title of the article is AOL Hell, an AOL content slave uh, speaks out, and it talks about uh, bloggers over at AOL and uh, basically what they're required to do and how many articles they're supposed to write and the guidelines. And um, I guess from my perspective here is... If you are a blogger and you're hiring anyone to do articles for you, um, this is not what you want to strive to do. Um, you know, I've got a, a number of folks at Geek News Central that uh, that write for us. We don't set minimums. We don't set uh, limits. I actually have an upper limit on how many total they can post a month. If they're going to go over that, they need to let me know so I don't blow my budget out. Um, it's on a pay-per-topic view um i get to uh, you know I pay, I pay a decent wage uh, i feel i do anyway considered to some other sites um i pay a bonus on specific type of articles which pays about three times as much as what a normal article would for what i would call feature articles but looking at the aol model they just uh, were purely nothing more than a a machine for a writer to put out 10 to 11 articles every eight hours. And, you know, I hate to say this. It doesn't sound like a lot, 10 or 11 articles for an eight-hour period because, you know, you can write up a pretty good blog post in about 20 minutes. But 
that's really a lot. That is a lot of uh, a lot of content to put out. And then these guys were having panic attacks. Hey, Norbert, I saw your son snuck in there real quick. Yeah, he just got up. <laughs> <laughs> nice thing about being a kid on summer vacation. Yeah, well, I'm a. I kind of I kind of go old school. My my dad was a type that, uh, uh, on the well, I'd let him get away with it. He'd let me get away with a little bit more on the weekends, but on weekdays, he would be like, "Get your old Coley out of bed and uh, and move. I got chores for you to do." But uh, I don't have too many chores here. We live, you know, in uh, suburbia, so I. It's not like I can send them out and, and do any farm work. Yeah, exactly. Same here. You know, no, no wood to chop or anything like that. Just uh, maybe a lawn to mow every now and then. Uh, they complain okay. and they complain about that. But what do you guys think about these, uh, you know, ale content slaves? These guys that are just, you know, the thing I look at this is they chose to do this. They're making about thirty five k a year, which is not a lot, but um, I guess in some parts of the country, that's a, probably a, a living. Well, the, the, from my perspective, what they're writing, I mean, like you say, yeah, you can you can uh, knock out a post in 20 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever, but what's the quality of that post? Right. Uh, how deeply can you research a topic and how well can you know a topic uh, and really convey something worth reading in that period of time? And I, I think what you end up with is a lot of fluff. You know, there's a lot of sites that will name remain nameless that are constantly publishing just basically junk. And when you, when you go to search on the internet, you find all these sites that have useless information, lots of verbiage, no content, and it pollutes the real value of the internet. Uh, so I think it's cross purpose to getting good, solid information out there you know, as well as being hard on the writer. <laughs> this is, this is, this is the crazy part. They were giving, Basically, you get an email with a link to a video clip, and it might be about Law and Order, Family Guy, Dancing with the Stars. It would be a two- to three-minute clip of something about that show, and then they were immediately told to write about the show. And so originally they were given about 35 minutes to put the art together, but then it was reduced down to about 20 minutes, um, including time to format for the article, graphics, and, and so forth. But uh, they basically said, hey, I was, you know, I was essentially lying and putting together puff pieces, but it was all in this battle for, you know, the Google, getting Google traffic. And, well, that's yeah. the problem. You, you, you basically, they've got a, an article puppy mill type right. thing going on. Right. Where, you know, or, or um, not a puppy mill, sorry, it'd be more like, you know, slave labor basically going out. And just grinding yeah. these people into the dirt to come up with something. So, like Dr. Bill said, you know, you, how much knowledge can you put into that? What, how much real uh, information are you getting in this article? How much can they put? You know, time do they really get and to give a quality piece? I'd rather have a good quality piece rather than a, a bit of fluff. Yeah. And they were uh, getting uh, paid on uh, basically volume. And, um, you know, and it's just, it's, you look at the, the volume that they had to do on each article to, to really earn money and it's significant. It really was. Well, guys, um, that's it for today. I need to, normally I'd go a little longer, but I have to leave the house here in an hour and, uh, we've got an early morning start. I gotta get everybody up and out of bed, but I want to thank you guys both for coming out, hanging out with me today. Of course, Dr. Bill, again, where can they find you? Uh, I'm at drbill.cc for Computer Curmudgeon and also drbill.tv. You can also follow me on Twitter at at D-R-B-I-L-L-B-A-I-L-E-Y, Dr. Bill Bailey. And Norbert, where can they find you at? You can find me over at totallycooltech.com, and you can check me out on Twitter or Facebook. Just look for TCT Podcast. And um, I'm looking to get more Twitter followers, as a matter of fact. Uh, <laughs> I've been having some fun Aren't out we there, all? Uh, especially <laughs> lately. So TCT Podcast is your Twitter name? Correct. Very, very cool. So, of course, you can follow me at, at Geek News. Of course, those of you that are uh, watching or listening to this live, def don't forget we've got uh, a number of great shows here. We've got our twice-weekly Geek News Central podcast that is hosted by me. We have got The Gadget Professor, which is comes out every Thursday, hosted by uh, Don Bain. 
We've got robot underpants, our news and information coming out of uh, San Francisco and Silicon Valley by Langley. And, of course, this show, Saturday Morning Tech. So I want to thank all of you for, for watching and listening. If you've got comments about today's show, you can send me an email at geeknews at gmail.com. Of course, our voicemail hotline remains available 24-7 at 619-342-7365. And I want to give both of my, my guests a, a thank you for uh, being here early this morning and hanging out. And uh, for the rest of you that are following, I will be uh, in Washington, D.C. for the next two shows of Geek News Central, Beyond the Road. And then there will be no Saturday morning tech next week because I will be airborne coming home. But then we'll be back on a regular schedule. Guys, any final parting thoughts? Uh, just uh, happy Father's Day to everybody tomorrow. So. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> yeah, I got that yeah, going on that. here, so. Congrats to on your uh, degree. Uh, that's really exciting news. I know you're you're happy to get that. And by the way, on the gadget professor, I really enjoyed the uh, the last one I saw on uh, uh, the Roku. I'm a huge Roku fan, and he had some good info on that. So a uh, uh, lot of lot of good stuff out there on Tech Podcast. Absolutely, and, and uh, Geek News Central. Yeah, tech. Check out the 130 some shows over at TechPodcast.com. All family safe content and. Uh, and a great uh, group of guys and gals over there. But everyone else, thank you so much for hanging out today with us. I'll have the stream up for a few more minutes, but this is the end of the formal recording. We'll see you next time. Aloha.